everybody, welcome back to the channel. This video is gonna be on the bull side of Netflix. Now, a lot of people today, including myself, have put out arguments about why Netflix was probably not the right pick. There's a lot of issues, they already grow too much, user-generated content is better, they don't really have any good content on Netflix, blah, 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 blah. There's tons of reasons why Netflix sucks right now. We get it, the stock is in the gutter. But, media mogul Tom Rogers thinks Netflix will become the most valuable media company in the world. And he just did an interview with CNBC. It's seven minutes long. I really want to analyze his arguments. It's not really me refuting his arguments. It's more so me just analyzing and breaking it down. And for you and for those of you that are watching that have not gotten the bull side of Netflix because lo lo likely all of the coverage you've consumed has been Netflix sucks and here's why. I think it is important even on days like this when the stock price is in the gutter and you're like, man, this sucks to still see what the bull side is and still see what other people are saying. So let's pull this up right now. going to be be very interested to go through this um, and and then discuss it. So here we are. Let's start watching this. Let's bring in media mogul and CNBC contributor Tom Rogers. He's the executive chairman of Engine Media and Gaming. Um, Tom, always great to speak with you. Great to be here. Thanks, Melissa. Do you think Netflix can reaccelerate its growth in its shareholder letter? They say our plan is to reaccelerate our viewing and revenue growth by continuing to improve all aspects of Netflix on top of monetizing, on top of growing internationally. Can they do this? Well, first, let me address the issue you talked about in terms of people disconnecting a streaming service over the next 12 months. Uh, people are disconnecting streaming services all the time. The monthly churn on Apple TV is 10%. The monthly churn on HBO Max is almost 7%. That's monthly. Think of what that is in a year. So there's nothing new about many people disconnecting some streaming service over the course of a year. Second thing I'd say is, as much as people are focused on streaming subscription services in a period of inflation and tightening pocketbooks, the real beneficiary of inflation, I think, is going to be Netflix. And why do I say that? Because where people are really going to cut back is their $100 cable or satellite package. That's going to go. And the legacy media companies are making it a whole lot easier for people to get rid of those when they move things like Dancing with the Stars over to Disney+. Plus. So let's analyze that argument real quick. The first thing he says is that, look, uh, uh, churn is inevitable, right? Especially in these businesses, you have, you know, oh, almost 10% churn in subscription businesses, especially on consumer businesses month over month, which means over the entire year, it can be upwards of 50%. Netflix has one of the lowest consumer churn businesses, uh, can churn rates in the business, in the streaming business. So that's a good thing, right? So he's like, look, out of all the big guys, Netflix is still doing better. The problem is like, Netflix is doing pretty bad. So if all the other, you know, <laughs> big guys are, are, are compared to Netflix, they might, you know, that's why HBO, Disney, or Disney and Hulu, and, Disney and Roku dropped last night after earnings for Netflix because it was pretty bad, right? So that, that's the first thing. But a second argument is very interesting as well, which is that if inflation is bad and the average price, and he's going to talk about it, you're spending like 80 to 90 bucks a month on entertainment. If you cancel that, where are you going to go? And his argument is like most people are going to go to Netflix to get their entertainment. And that's where inflation ultimately becomes good for people because if you got to get rid of streaming and you got to get something that's cheaper, Netflix is like 15 bucks a month, well, that's a way cheaper alternative uh, and you get a bang for your buck and you save on in, uh, in inflationary time. So, I mean, that argument makes sense. The question is, is there that many people that are going to cancel TV just because of inflation? I don't think, you know, 80 million households are going to cancel TV just because of inflation, I mean, people still want, to, you know, especially if you still have cable TV, you probably still want your channels. Like that's just how it works. If you if you're still subscribed to cable TV, uh, which means it's hard to imagine all of those people are going to just go to Netflix anytime soon. Uh, which means the growth curve is not necessarily likely going to improve even in this inflationary environment. But it is an interesting argument to hear that inflation actually is good for Netflix. And you can save a lot of money getting rid of that $100, picking up a few streaming services. And I think Netflix will be a direct beneficiary of that. Obviously, the legacy media companies are going to take a hit there. So I think the question with Netflix is really this. Um, it, it's obvious that the bear case is dominating in the market now, that Netflix lost subs, it's, it went negative, and uh, therefore its growth is stymied. I think the real question is, is, is whether Netflix growth is sl slowed or its ultimate ability to get where people thought it could get as a several hundred million streaming service is still intact. It's just going to take longer to get there. Now, obviously, taking longer to get there affects discounted cash flows, et cetera, and the stock price comes down. But there's very little here to suggest to me 
that the preponderance of pay TV homes around the world, of which there are four or 500 million outside of Russia and China that are up for grabs for Netflix still, or the 600 million broadband homes that are not mobile only type homes, but true broadband homes aren't up for grabs for Netflix still. So clearly growth is slowed. It's gonna take longer to get there. But the long-term arc is streaming wins out over linear TV, linear demise benefits Netflix. And in the end of the day, they're ultimately going to be a much more valuable company than the market's suggesting right now. So, Tom, you've had uh, extremely... So, again, it's very interesting. I mean, he's been a very big bull on Netflix for a long time. His argument is like they're the clear leaders in the category, even though uh, things are bad right now from like a short-term perspective, discounted cash flows is gonna take them longer to generate free cash flow, all that stuff. Like, yeah, that's fine. But his argument is people are still gonna to flock to Netflix at the end of the day, especially in this type of environment uh, with the demise of linear TV. Look, it makes sense. At the end of the day, I think those people might go to user-generated content more, places like YouTube and TikTok, but I guess we'll see. Depression calls over your whole career. Um, I agree with you uh, that Netflix should be the beneficiary of this. But what levers can they pull now? Do you think they go to a two-tier system where they have ads? What can they do immediately on their behalf, not just the trend? Well, a lot of people are pushing ads out. A lot of analysts on CNBC today begged them to come up with an, an ad tier. I, I don't think they'll go there quickly. And in part, the reason is the only place advertising is really valuable in terms of going in that direction is the U.S., and Europe, and in the U.S. at 84% penetration of pay TV subs, um, I don't think there's really that much upside from an ad-supported tier unless they really began to see churn. They have enviable churn. Their churn has been the lowest in the industry. If they really see pricing here driving an issue for them, then I think they could consider a lower-priced ad service. Europe, they're actually doing quite well. And the thing that people uh, should focus on in terms of Europe and pricing and whether or not Netflix has pricing power, in the U.S., as I mentioned, average cable bill is 90 or or $100. In Europe, it's only about $26. And they have pricing of Netflix pretty close to where it is in the U.S. And having said that, that comparison suggest with the same number of subs in Europe for Netflix as they have in the U.S., some 75 million subs, they are doing extraordinarily well to be able to price that that close to what people are paying for their pay TV package. So I'm not convinced that they have demonstrated they don't have pricing power. They always face resistance when they do it. But uh, netting out FX effects over the course of this quarter, uh, their revenue per sub was up nicely in, in every region. And uh, I think that actually bodes well for their, for their pricing. And more importantly, when it comes to competition, their viewing audience, even with the uh, Peacocks and Paramounts and Hulus, um, uh, low, lower distributed and therefore uh, making greater sub gains, the amount of watched minutes on Netflix has actually grown comparatively. Okay, so let's analyze what he's saying right here. The biggest thing I think he's talking about, and yes, he's doing comparison about how they're doing in Europe and, and sort of how they're doing in terms of their watch time in relationship to other platforms. But the ad business, I mean, this is on the on the earnings call. Reed Hastings said, look, I hate the ad business. I think it's complex, but I'm a fan of consumer choice. So if consumers really do want Netflix content at a lower um, sort of quality because you have to deal with ads in the middle of it, then but you don't have to pay for anything. And then I want to give people that option. Now, it's funny he's saying that 15 years into the business, right? It's like, well, maybe if you thought about that earlier, you would have actually had the ability to have like top of the funnel brand awareness to get people into the system. They, they're they going to hate the ads. They're going to upgrade to the pay subscription. That's like another form of customer acquisition. But his argument was always no ads. It's going to always be streaming, uh, which I get it, right? That was his founder vision. And, and that's kind of what he executed against. And it made sense. It's just, you know, ads kind of work to get people into the door. And they were always against this like low tier offering. Now they're open to it. And who Hulu has been doing it for a very long time. So like, the, my, my, so if it, his argument, Tom's argument is like, look, it's not really going to work because 80, you've already penetrated 84% of paid net 
uh, subs in the United States. So it's like there's not that much room for advertising. The reason he's talking about America and Europe is because those are the people that advertisers want to target because they have disposable income, right? Like it's if you're building out an ads business, it's very difficult because you've already got TV to compete with. You've got YouTube com to compete with. You have to generate massive amounts of data for the ROI on that ad targeting to be ROI friendly for the advertiser. So it's a, I mean, Netflix would have to hire probably a, a, at least a thousand people to build out a proper ads team from the selling of the ads to the creation of the ad technology to the actual recruitment of um, um, uh, data that is, or data engineers that are necessary to build a meaningful ads product at scale. And when we're talking about at scale, we're talking about Japan, South Korea, United States, India. They all have to get personalized advertising. That's why it's a complex business. It's, it's more simple to just take someone's, you know, credit card and, and charge them per month. Um, so at that point, this guy's saying, look, like the other countries, they don't have disposable income, so the ads are not going to be that profitable. They're not. You're not going to generate an ROI. Uh, there's not even a point of targeting them. But in America and Europe, it makes sense. But in America, they've already penetrated. So, like, what's the value to ads at that point? So he's making a decent argument for ads not being the basis to save Netflix. And he's staying true with his thesis. I just think if it gives you a better chance to have customer acquisition, then, you know, it would be interesting. And I'm going to show you guys a tweet around customer acquisition in a second that is probably going to blow your mind. So let's finish this up. And that, to me, suggests that the competitive uh, onslaught that people are talking about is really not all that meaningful relative to Netflix subscribers. Tom, it's always great to get your perspective. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Okay, that was it for him. So let's go to this tweet I want to show you guys. I mean, um, and so again, because he's saying watch time is better on Netflix, even with competition, he's saying that competition is not as bad. That's kind of his point. Um, look at this tweet. That Look at this yesterday. Netflix spent $556 million in marketing last quarter and still managed to shrink their subscriber base by 200K subs. Five. That's almost half a billion in marketing. If they, well, that is half a billion in marketing. If they paid people $100 to sign up, that 556 million would have generated them 5.6 million new subs. Now that would be a hundred dollar customer acquisition cost, but like in, in comparison to losing 200K subs, it might've been better. If they spent $33 uh, SAC per cub for, per sub, they would have had 16 million subs. Uh, SAC, I'm not sure exactly what that means. I think that's just like if they had decreased uh, the customer acquisition cost. But that's the point, right? Imagine you gave... 5 million people, 100 bucks, boom, that's your marketing budget, you've got 5 million new subs. Now, the churn on that probably would be high, but still, nonetheless, that'd be crazy, right? Um, so, churn must have been enormous, that's the point. If Netflix had just taken their whole marketing budget and literally just given it to people to sign up, they would have been able to show analysts, we spent the same amount of money that we spent on, like, Twitter ads or Facebook ads or whatever, and at least we brought 5 million people. So if analysts, but you paid hundred dollars to get them, you'd be like, yeah, but it's better than spending that money on ads and then losing 200,000. At least we brought 5 million and imagine, I don't know, a million of them stay after the next month, right? Let's say, uh, you know, 4 million people take the hundred bucks, but, uh, but a million of them actually continue to stay. So like maybe it's, it's net negative for like a year and then it turns to be positive and you have a million more subs. Like it, the math and economics around it are super weird, but the fact that they've churned so aggressively kind of shows that if they actually literally just pay people, they wouldn't have churned that aggressively. Even the customer acquisition cost would have been insane. So interesting to understand the bull perspective on Netflix. Roger thinks that, or Tom thinks that ads are not going to be the biggest savior. He thinks watch time and minutes are still better than all the other competition. And he thinks that Netflix is still the premier leader in an inflationary environment because people are going to choose that over anything else. Let me know your guys' thoughts on the bull case on Netflix. Do you think there is a bull case? And do you think Tom Rogers uh, actually has an argument to make for why Netflix should succeed in this time? Thank you guys so much for watching. Looking forward to comments. I'll see you in the next one.